Hello, Guilty Feminists. This week's show is a bit different from usual. We recorded it before and after a very special advanced screening of the new film Late Night, written by Mindy Kaling and starring Mindy Kaling and Emma Thompson. So firstly, you'll hear Emma Thompson and me talking live at the Picture House Central before the screening. And then you'll be able to hear me having a private one-on-one with Mindy Kaling at a press junket in London. And then the final part of the episode will be more of me and Emma at the Picture House after the film is over. There might be one or two very minor spoilers for the film, but nothing that's going to ruin your enjoyment of it. So if you're super spoiler phobic, see the film first and come back and listen to the rest of the episode, but otherwise dive right in. And you can see the film at a cinema near you from June 7th. Try and go opening weekend and send a message to Hollywood that we love films written by women and driven by women. And now on with this very exciting episode of The Guilty Feminist. I can't wait for you to hear this one. I'm a feminist, but I am more excited to introduce this woman than I would be to introduce Gloria Steinem if she were coming out to resurrect Emmeline Pankhurst and Maya Angelou live on this stage. Please welcome to the stage the incredible, the one, the only, the legendary, the national treasure, Emma Thompson! Thank you very much. Yeah, she took that a bit far, I think. But anyway, I'll take it. So I am a feminist, but some years ago in my 20s, I was doing a play on film um, called Knuckle with Tim Roth, who, um, um, my my husband's in the audience tonight, so I'm going to be careful how I say this, who I quite fancied, actually. And um, there was a scene where I suddenly realised that I had to appear in a swimming costume. So I put the swimming costume on in my dressing room and obviously hated my body immediately because that's what I did. That's what I've done, actually, every day since I was 14. I put it on and I saw there were a few, there was a bit of a you know, <laughs> happening. And, um, and I tried to push them in. And, I was like, and if I thought if I sound like that, no, I look like a dick. Um, and, and then I, I thought, OK, look, I, so I got into the shower of my dressing room and I was scraping away at it with a razor. She was just going off, going off. The time was ticking by and finally I thought, I thought nothing happened except I'd made nasty marks on my thighs. And then I came out I thought, OK, I can't, I can't. It's, Tim's there and he's really hot. And I think, <laughs> maybe I stand a chance if I don't go out with that like, epic forest sticking between my legs. And then I went and looked at my costumes and I found a pair of tweed trousers. I put them on and I went downstairs and I said to the director, I think my character would have a problem with swimming in a just um, a swimming costume. I think that she's quite buttoned up and I'm going to do this scene in tweed trousers. <laughs> Which I did. And then when I got back to the dressing room, I realised I had not taken the cap off the razor. <laughs> Tragic. That is a truly delightful story. Sad. Did you do the scene in tweed trousers? Yeah. Did you? Frankly, yeah. that's some know, Hollywood committed. heft on your part that they allowed that. No, 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 no. They just didn't know who I was and thought I was, you know, mentally unstable. Oh, they just <laughs> Which, thought... in fact, it was. Actually. They just think you were British and eccentric. Yeah, maybe. Well, I've got one more. I'm a feminist, but I decided I was too pale just before I left the house. So I put on some fake tan that's fast developing. So at the moment, I'm an oak. But like a Polaroid over this evening... <laughs> I will continue to develop and maybe by the end of the evening mahogany. I felt I should declare that in case anyone noticed. At least we're all in on it. It's fun for everyone now. (laughs) So I am so excited to be here with Emma Thompson introducing this incredible film, Late Night, by Mindy Kaling, starring Mindy Kaling and Emma Thompson. Now, when I heard it was about a woman who had an American late-night chat show and had had one for 30 years, I assumed it was science fiction (laughs) and that I'd be seeing Emma in a silver jumpsuit with anti-gravity boots. But when I watched it, it wasn't really science fiction. It was more like a sort of fantasy alternative reality like Wakanda, um, (laughs) where there is a world, a parallel universe, where a woman could be a chat show host and have been for 30 years, and it can be this year. Is this a life you think you could have had 
Because you started out, you won the Perrier. You were the first Perrier. They invented the Perrier for you, really. And... I didn't win it. I won it with Hugh Laurie, Stephen Fry, and that's so interesting. Because when Zachary. I asked Hugh Laurie that, he said he did win it. So that's <laughs> he didn't mention you at all. It just it's like it didn't come up. He was like, "Yeah, I did. I won it. It was invented for me." Absolutely. So you won the very first Perrier with some men, mm. and you went on and you did comedy. Yeah. Did you do stand up? I did briefly. I did sketch comedy for years with Hugh and Stephen and Ben, actually, trying desperately to sort of occasionally write things and kind of shoulder them in. I've written this... Oh, no, I'm just sorry. I've just... I've tried... I've written this... Oh, no. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll just... I'll put it over here. And then I would rehearse the things I'd written in a corner. And they'd all go because they weren't interested. So it was very difficult to wedge yourself into anything or feel confident enough to write any comedy, but I did do stand-up. In fact, I spent my 25th birthday doing stand-up at the Croydon Warehouse. I got 60 so quid. Sorry. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> but it was such an extraordinary feeling, except I knew that I would die of fright before the age of 30 if I carried on doing it because it is very, very frightening. And I did stand-up on... Nelson's column when I was about 24. Well, that adds to the fear in a way that's unnecessary. Yes, it is. You're absolutely right. It was a political rally. Yeah, I think you're adding in a fear of heights there. And if you die on Nelson's column, it's just a long climb down, isn't it? It's just like if you die in a comedy club, you can just sort of out through the curtain, out the back, Mm. and off you go. You're on your way. Nelson's, it's just such a long climb down Mm. when everyone's like, that wasn't funny. I wouldn't do that now. I don't understand how that can have happened. But it was a political rally, and they said, up you go, Emma. Yeah, do you the CMT comedy? said do some... Because all the stand-up I did was at political rallies, at the political benefits. And sometimes it went very well and sometimes it didn't. But the comedy store was terrifying, that place. And it was very, very blokey. I mean, stand-up's still pretty blokey here. I haven't noticed. <laughs> I'm <I've, I've>... sure. <laughs> Well, that's, um... Yeah, no, it is still significantly blokey, but spaces like the Guilty Feminist and other spaces Indeed. are changing that. That's right. And we're doing a national tour at the moment, and we've had nary a man on the stage, and we've had houses of sort of 1,500 people. And I have said, isn't it amazing? It's an amazing time that we can do this. Did you have a good experience when you had your own sketch show? I did a sketch show in Edinburgh on stage, which was pretty good, actually. I mean, it was a bit of a struggle, but it was pretty good. And then I did an hour for Channel 4 where I wrote the script and they accepted it. And then the guy who ran Channel 4 said, I don't understand this. And of course, why would he understand it? He'd never heard a woman talking about funny stuff before. You know, I mean, it literally was like, it's like a new language. It was like a new language back then. There wasn't, there wasn't much. There was Victoria Wood and there was French and Saunders and I was doing stuff that was, of course, it was feminist because I was a feminist, but it was interpreted in the most extraordinarily... Um, but everyone felt so hurt. It's man-hating, they said. Anyway, this guy who ran <laughs> Channel 4 said, I don't understand why this is funny. So I said, well, I'll do it for you then. So I did the whole show for him in his office. <gasps> Wow. And he laughed. He said, OK, then, you can make it. But it was like that then. And then I did a six half hours, which were quite out there, and they were very different and new. And the press were kind of extraordinary. <clears throat> Michael Palin came back from one of his long tours, and he read The Independent and The Guardian. The Independent said, this is an important bit of comedy by a young artist who's trying to stretch the boundaries of comedy and trying to change the voice of comedy, and The Guardian said, who the fuck gave this woman money to make this shit? They were so rude. I mean, they were incredibly personal and rude. And Mike watched it and said, I was this extraordinary. This is a comedy show. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. It's a comedy show. So it's a bit like this. It causes people, because they go, well, I haven't heard this. It does not compute. And um, so I stopped doing comedy. And I thought, OK, so I better do drama then. I better do drama because they don't want me to be funny. That's interesting because that's the power structures at the time. Yeah. Just saying, you're not welcome in this space. This oh, is not you. a female space. Get into that space. Having said that, I was helped by a male producer of comedy who helped women and people of colour with comedians, Humphrey Barclay, who also championed Desmond's, which was one of the first sitcoms that starred anybody of colour. So he was great. I mean, you know, there are great allies as you come up. But it's interesting about this film because everyone sort of comes out. Actually, no, let's talk about this later. Yeah. Great. Okay, so this is Late Night. It's about a late night 
Chacha Host, starring Emma Thompson. It's written by Mindy Kaling and also starring Mindy Kaling. And you're going to enjoy it very much. <laughs> it's a wonderful comedy and I can't wait for you to see it. We'll see you later. See you later. <laughs> we'll see you after. Hello, this is Felicity Ward, sometimes co-host of the Guilty Feminist podcast that you're listening to right now. Hey, I just wanted to tell you, I'm in a play at the moment. I'm starring in a play called Kill Climate Deniers. I know, it's a lighthearted title. It's on at the Pleasance Theatre for all of June in London from the 4th of June it starts. And what we're doing is we're offering a little discount just for friends of the show. You can type in Creative 12 and you can get uh, cheaper tickets for the first week. It's selling really fast anyway. We just want to fill it up. So please go to pleasance.co.uk for those tickets or you can go to my Instagram page and that will have the link and it's at Felicity Ward. But you already follow me on Instagram, I'm sure. Anyway, um, you're great. I'll see you there. Love you. Bye. You are, dedicated episode to you are the only second person on The Guilty Feminist to be not in front of an audience and have something dropped in. The other one was Sadiq Khan, the London mayor. Oh. First of all, I have to say, it's so great to meet you. I need to tell you, I've watched every single episode of The Mindy Project. You did? I did. I, I did. I'm, I'm delighted and surprised. Wait, are we, we're rolling now. This I think is all happening, right? Yeah, I think we're rolling. Okay, I mean, perfect. we might not use every second of this. We may then. No, like, this is gold. This, but you'll want to use, you know, the sound <laughs> of the door <laughs> the, happening. You know, they're trying to lock the door. Literally, the- a man trying to. Is he trying to wedge a door open? There's something going on here. Chris, our sound engineer, Chris Sharp, is doing some serious wedging there. Chris, you're hard at work. Thank you. Chris knows what he's you doing. You earn your money. We don't. We don't it's know. Impressive. What Chris does. Look at all these buttons. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm friends with Ed Weeks, actually. We used to do Edinburgh together back in the day. Great guy. And he dated my roommate once. So I sort of lived with Ed Weeks for a bit, you know, on and off. And you have remained friends, though they broke up. Yes, absolutely. But this is not the plot of your movie. Um, (laughs) (laughs) No, it's a love life of one of my co-stars. That's more interesting to me. I know, I know. It's a little bit of side goss (laughs) going on right there. Can I say I enjoyed Late Night so much and I found it so funny. Thank you. But I will also say that the observations of about structural violence to women in comedy were so on the money, I cried like it was Terms of Endearment. Wow. And I saw it at a screening room in Soho at 10 a.m. on a Monday morning just with two other people. I was sitting there. They were like looking at me like this because I was like... <gasps> Like this, wow. there was just something that triggered that w- when your character was being brutalized mm. by the system and being spoken to in certain ways and marginalized in certain ways and being treated like she wasn't funny and brutalized, basically, mm. it just triggered something deep in me as a woman in comedy. I didn't know I felt so traumatized. So that resonated <laughs> with you. You feel your experiences have, it, it made you remember your experiences or that felt real to you. On a cellular level. Wow, indeed. I'm so happy. I mean, I'm not happy that you have those experiences, <laughs> but I am happy that it's resonating because you make these movies and it's not like there was an abundance of us or anyone else there to, to remember what it was like to come up like that. So it is beyond gratifying to hear that, though I, I'm, of course, I'm sorry that you went through it. No, well, I was so surprised because mm-hmm. I didn't know – I mean, obviously I knew, it, you know, I'd had some experiences, but I've also had wonderful happy times in comedy. I'm still in comedy. Mm-hmm. The Guilty Feminist podcast is amazing mm-hmm. to do and I work with all these incredible women. So it was such a surprise to me that it was deep down inside of me, like deep in my vagina, I think, and it just <laughs> bubbled up and then it was just coming out of my face. Mm. And I wasn't just like tears rolling down. I was like, <gasps> yeah. and everyone was like looking at me like, nobody's dying in this movie. Why are you crying so hard? So I guess I want to ask you, like how much of this is drawn from your experience as a woman in comedy and also a woman of color in comedy coming up, being in writer's rooms, I'm not asking you to name names. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the experience of being the only woman and the only minority in a writer's room was, is from my life. It Mm -hmm. is how it was when I worked on the American version of The Office that first year. That being said, the writer's room on that show, which was Greg Daniels, Michael Schur, BJ Novak, were not at all 
like the writers scene, although they had a lot of the trappings of the writers you see in the movie. But the reason why the movie was something I felt I needed to write was that the two leads, I identified completely with both of them. Mm-hmm. Emma's character, who's been in comedy for a while and feels, you know, a little complacent, a little out of touch, impatient, a huge grouch. That is definitely how I was after doing 117 episodes of my show. Right. But I also vividly remember the terror that you feel coming into this world where you don't look like anyone else that's been hired and everybody knows that you are the diversity hire. I'm in America... A diversity hire is a it's a turn of phrase, isn't it? Yes. For somebody who's hired um, now all, to fill a quota. To fill a quota, but in reality, I know from my friends who work in America, who are mm-hmm. women of color, and I have some very close friends who are working in writers' rooms out there. They have to be so good to get into that room. Mm-hmm. So it's not like there's this low standard for women of color. It feels like they have to be better than the white guys, to Mm -hmm. get into the room in the first place. But then there's this diversity hire thing hanging over their head. Yeah, it's such a tricky thing because I owe, you know, at NBC where I was the diversity hire, my salary was paid by the network so that that it didn't take a hit financially on the show. So it was really successful in incentivizing people to hire minorities. The problem is everyone knows you're a diversity hire. And if you're the only person of color in the room, you feel, A, I have to make it here without having any allies necessarily. Mm -hmm. And then also I represent, if I have a bad day, if one of the writers on the show has a bad day, one of the, one of my white male colleagues, you don't think, okay, well that's representative of all white men and how their talents. But when you do badly on a show like that, you also feel that you're, you're letting down a huge group of people. So it's terrifying to be a diversity hire, especially if you're only one of them, which is for a long, long time, there would just be one minority in a room. You're free that first year. And then if you're not good, then you're fired. Mm -hmm. So writing this stirred a lot of my own like fearful feelings that I had 14, 15 years ago when I first started out Mm -hmm. on the, but it was, it was really cathartic to write about it. I feel the same way on British comedy panel shows. Mm -hmm. You know, you go out and there's generally only one woman. Yeah. And they made a rule it had to be one woman and they've pretty much taken that (laughs) as a maximum. And uh, (laughs) you're sitting there and you know, you know, you're told as a woman, stay off Twitter for two days because people are going to go, oh, I'm not funny. And it's like you're carrying like your whole gender, Mm -hmm. like you're reflecting your whole gender. So you've got to be good because you're proving that 51% of the population is funny. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's a lot. It's a lot (laughs) to carry. And, And so that experience really came out for me. Um, now, obviously, this film is kind of a science fiction film because it's about a woman on late night television who has her own show. Mm-hmm. And that clearly is something for a time well into the future. Yes. <laughs> it still hasn't happened. It's 2019, and you're still more likely to have your own show if you're called Jimmy than if you're a woman. <laughs> That's true. Like, if, in fact, very good chance if you're Jimmy, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy Corden. They, if you're born named James, you have a one in three likelihood that you'll go and become a late night talk show it's, host on a main major it's, network. It's um, certainly if I had a son, that's what I would be calling him. <laughs> just, you know, uh, just, just fingers crossed. What made you imagine a world in which a woman could be a late night chat show host? And how did that kind of like inform the whole piece? Honestly, it came from the fact that it didn't seem like me, Mindy Kaling, was going to write a movie with a male lead, a 58-year-old white male lead in having this job. And then I thought, well, if I make it a woman, it's not going to be believable. And then I was thinking, well, no, Lin-Manuel Miranda just played Hamilton in the biggest theater phenomenon we've ever had. I'm sure that if he can play Hamilton, we can imagine a woman playing a late night talk show host. It's a much smaller leap to make. Well, like Star Trek, though, they say Star Trek, the original series, informed a lot of the gadgets we have because the gadget makers were going, oh, how would we do that? So similarly, I think your movie is going to inspire women being late night hosts. I hope so. Man, from your lips to God's ears. Because I I think, though, casting Emma, I mean, I wrote the movie for Emma, I don't think there's anyone who has left the movie, whether they like it or don't like it, who isn't like, oh, I'd completely buy her being oh, a late night talk totally show host. Oh, you totally buy it. You and totally that it. she got the job, you know, 28 years ago, 30 years ago, and that she's been doing it for so long. And she, her whole demeanor, it seems as though, honestly, when I watched her, I was like, it felt like, did I adapt this from a a play that she did where she played a talk show host? You just feel so at ease. And we shot this movie 
in 25 days. We didn't have any rehearsal. We had no money. Wow. So she just stepped into this role and and just knew who Catherine was and just did it, you know, with almost no direction. You're both so good in it. And, oh, thank you. But she is so plausible as this really hard-bitten, you can see she's been brutalized in her day <laughs> and, and that's built up and she feels like that's the only way she knows how to be now, which, again, I recognize. And I think some of the emotion I was feeling when I was watching it was around the way sometimes women treat other women mm-hmm. because of the structural bias and there's absolutely the power structures that be completely well i really resonate with emma's character has this very flawed view of my success is enough that i've done enough for women Mm. if people can see me i'm the only woman female late night talk shows that's enough i don't have to do anything else and a lot of people feel that way and i remember when i started my show i thought it was so insurmountable the amount Mm. of work and the things that i had against me to become a lead of a sitcom on a major network. I can't do anymore. I don't, there's not enough time in the day. And of course, you know, I realized that that's incorrect. It isn't enough unless we're making, you know, providing opportunities for other women, other people of color as employers, we're we're not really doing enough. But what's, I think, really fun about the movie is I think both characters, both Emma's character and mine, would identify as feminist but we're completely different kinds of feminists. Mm. Those are the kind of things, intersectional feminism, that is, I find very interesting. They don't really sound very funny, so I haven't talked about it that much yeah. in, terms of, in terms of the movie, but it is a Our lot of what I thought about. eat that up, Mindy. Good, good. Our so listeners, I'm, they're just thinking, she said intersectional feminism. This yeah. is the greatest day ever. Okay, good, um. good, good, good. <laughs> I'm talking to the right person then for my interests. Completely, completely. Are you, please wind up. What? What? This is so fun, though. Um, I, we, I talked about Ed Weeks' love life for like a full third of this. I, no, you Who did not. Who cares about Ed? You did not. You did not. Can I just quickly ask you, do you have an I'm a feminist but? So the our cold open of our podcast is I'm a feminist but. So, for example, this is a true one. I'm a feminist but sometimes I fantasize about famous, fictitious, misogynist Don Draper. And I truly believe that if I met him, I could make him whole and heal his pain. Um, do you That's have anything? Fantastic. Do you have anything that you feel like is a, ju- a paradox to your feminism? Like I'm a feminist, but I'm a feminist, but I love the movie Master and Commander: The Far Side of the Ocean, <laughs> nice. which is for any self-respecting feminist, it is a very strange movie. It is one of my favorite movies. There's no female characters. I don't think there's a single person of color in that movie, and I fucking love it. I don't know what to say. I'm telling you, I'm the same about Chariots of Fire. It's the absolute best. There's nary a woman in it, and it's all just about posh white men yeah. running. My movie is about English sailors in, during pirate <laughs> times, <laughs> Russell Crowe and um, Jennifer Connelly's husband. Yeah. I, they're, they're all on the high seas. They're all on the high thinking seas. Thinking man thoughts, thinking doing man, man thoughts. things and being violent. Yes. I hear that. And, and I'm I will a feminist, take that. but I like that movie. It's one of my favorite What a delight this has been. Ever. Thank you so thank much. You so and thank much. you for having Emma That's, and for supporting the movie so much. I really oh, appreciate it. I, I adore mean, her. And absolutely. she's so not like that character in real life. <laughs> no, she's not. No, she's not. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Also, Bisha sends her love. Bisha, I was about to ask you. She does this podcast a lot when she's in the UK, which is never now because of you. I, I hope made her I want her to stay in LA, but everyone at her. Hello, Guilty Feminist. I'm phoning in from the live tour. Yes, I'm on the road. Thank you so much to everybody who's come out. The audiences have been incredible all over the country. It's been such an amazing celebration, and I'm so happy to see so many of you there. And now we have a big announcement. We are playing the Royal Albert Hall on the 7th of July, Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. Now we're doing it in an afternoon slot so people can get back to different places around the country because we know you like to be in bed by 10 o'clock. We know our audience. So get tickets now. Make a weekend of it. The 6th of July in London is Pride and the 7th is the Royal Albert Hall show. Now it's the Royal Albert Hall. so There are things we can do there we can't do anywhere else. For example... We are going to open with a lot of our regular co-hosts doing a big song and dance number. We are going to have some guests we've never had on before. We are going to have some extraordinary theatrical pieces we've never been able to do before. We are going to have music. We are going to lift the ceiling of the Royal Albert Hall. If you've been to any of the live shows, it's in the same spirit, but it won't be the same material. 
you can come again and it's going to be like a guilty feminist annual general meeting we want as many guilty feminists from around the uk and europe to be there as possible which is why we're doing it on a sunday afternoon tickets start at 10 pounds because feminism but if you can afford a 25 pound or a 35 pound one please buy one of those and leave the £10 ones for those who can't afford them. We've said no tickets to be over 49, even the poshest possible seats. It's going to be an absolute extravaganza, and I just can't wait to tell you more about it. So please get tickets now. Do not wait, because they are going very, very fast. Also, next Monday, the 10th of June, we're doing a show at the BFI. It's a podcast recording, and we've got some very special guests. So get in now and get tickets while you can. Saturday, 8th of June. We will be in Belfast. Tickets are very nearly gone, so get in while you can. This Wednesday, the 5th of June, we are doing the Secret Policeman's Tour with Amnesty International. We have an incredible lineup, and I can announce exclusively to you that Rachel Bloom is going to pop in and do a set. So get tickets now. There really aren't many left. You can get tickets for all of these at guiltyfeminist.com. Also, my book is out in paperback and has new interviews with Hannah Gadsby and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Pick one up today. And finally, an announcement for our American and Canadian listeners. Late Night is coming out there in June and also twinning my new film, Say My Name, which opens in select theatres around the country. So go and do a double or go out to Late Night and stream Say My Name at home. It will be available on demand on June 14th, as well as available in select cinemas. You can pre-buy on Amazon and iTunes now, so get in and beat the rush. If you haven't seen the trailer, it's up on YouTube. It's a fabulous romantic comedy about a one-night stand gone wrong. And the film has been a festival, darling. I've already got four Best Picture Awards. Hurrah! So check it out using hashtag SayMyNameMovie or go to electricentertainment.com forward slash say hyphen my hyphen name for all the details and finally on the 4th of june at noon in trafalgar square there is going to be a protest for trump visiting london and i will be speaking at that rally so please come along and support if you want to find out where the guilty feminists will be check out our socials and now back to the podcast Thompson, everyone, star of Late Night. I really, really love this film. I loved it more the second time, and I cried in more appropriate places, which was good. Uh, And I love that you've managed to humanise this character, who could have been a bit of a 2D monster. And she's not. You can kind of see in her that she herself has been brutalised and has found it hard coming up. And has got to that point which I think a lot of women of this generation in various industries feel like no one helped me and there's only one spot at the top for a woman and if you start helping other women first of all they'll be suspicious of you because you're letting women in and that's what they thought about you when you got in and secondly no one helped you and you can't go helping people but you see that sort of start to crack in her relationship with Molly who's Mindy's character When you watch it, what kind of responses do you have having made it? Okay, like it or not, for men, the road to any job, but particularly in comedy, is like a motorway. You know, there's an awful lot of lanes and there's lots of different kinds of vehicles and there's bikes. There's lots of people in the motorway and they're all going in various directions and there's loads and loads of very good, well-signposted places to go and lots of roads and Mm. there's just tons of choice. And for women, there's a kind of mountain pass, a sort of gully, which is strewn with boulders and with lots of kind of false exits. And if you don't have someone, someone there to say, actually, don't go down there because there's a cliff edge and you're just going to have to turn around and come back and carry on. Um, Actually, if we all just got together, we could shift this boulder slightly over and it will just widen this bit, which will make it clear that that's the way you're supposed to go. That's what it's like for women everywhere, in every walk of life, every job. And comedy is a particularly hard number because, quite honestly, men don't know how or why women are funny because they often don't hear women being funny. And, of course, since I was a girl, people have been saying, well, of course, there was the old joke, you know, 
um, how many feminists does it take to change a light bulb? That's not funny. That was the gag. But of course, if women didn't have a sense of humour, we wouldn't have survived. <laughs> if we didn't have a sense of humour, we would all be dead. We would not have survived being female. That's the point. That's why we have a sense of humour and are very funny, because we needed it to survive. So that, I think, is vital to remember. We have a little gully place, and we don't know quite where. We need help. We need assistance. We need mentors. We need older women to say it's very important that Catherine makes that step, you know, that she changes. And that's what I think is so clever about Mindy's writing. Yes, she doesn't change her character, but you feel her come into the 21st century and enjoy it and relax and think, can I show vulnerability? Can I be collegiate with women? Can I be in a place where it's not all just white men and I'm the only one? And can that be a relief rather than something to be feared? Well, yeah, because she actually says, look, hell, I've been using even the same cadences as these guys. And I remember, I mean, that little piece of me doing stand-up was me doing stand-up when I was 23. In, yeah, in like the big, big Victoria, do you remember the big Victoria Wood shirts and yeah. jackets and everything? And all my stand up was about sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> I can't think why. Okay, I'll tell you, it's because an Australian boyfriend gave me herpes. And I was completely obsessed with herpes, um, which was around, around the same time as Margaret Thatcher was in power, and they were kind of similar. Um, <laughs> It's fantastically difficult to get rid of um, and very unhealthy. So that was my stuff. And I would go up to men in the audience. I would say, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to say, so how is your sexual hygiene? Because herpes, of course, is to do with sexual hygiene. And I would go up to them quite close and say, do you wash it properly? Like, really properly? He's nodding. Um, but, I mean, really, do you rootle around with a cotton bud? Do you really get underneath and, you know... Work, work into it. Oh, oh. young person. There. And and then blokes would just kind of. There would be women next to them going, "Oh, don't do it. Oh, you know, he does, he does, he does, he does." I mean, don't speak for him. Don't, don't, don't answer for him. There's no need. He can speak for himself. So that was my my method was. It was to terrorise the men in the audience about their sexual hygiene methods. And um, sometimes it went down quite well. And then I had a good gag about thrush. Um, yeah, which, um, as we all know, in the olden days, before you could just take one of those pill things, you did treat by putting tampons in yoghurt and shoving them up because the yoghurt helps with the candida, um, the yeast infection. I don't know if you know about that. Anyway, I'm telling you now. Um, and it's a very useful way. So anyway, my gag was, well, I sent my boyfriend out to get the yoghurt thing and he came back with tropical fruit and nut flavour. Um, and that got a big laugh 30 years ago, which just shows you nothing's changed. So that was my stand-up stuff. So for the listeners of the podcast, there is a scene in the film where Mindy's character Molly is watching Emma's character Catherine on a laptop, like a YouTube clip, and that was really you. Because I thought, how have they done that? Or is that really you? And it looked so Victoria Wood, the style. Yeah. And I'm delighted that yeah. it actually really was. was I will, well, I'm, I'm so going back to watch every single one of those clips. <laughs> um, did Mindy write this especially for you? Yeah. She because did. She did. And she was doing the Mindy Project at the time. It was five years ago. I was told that she had written something for me. I didn't really know much about her. I'd seen a little bit, but I don't watch telly and I'm very Luddite and in general and ignorant. And she came and she was in her Mindy Project outfit, which was quite out there. And I thought, <laughs> mm, she's quite weird. She's <laughs> quite weird. And she's written something for me. And most things that have been written for me are kind of about, you know, elderly kind of archaeologists, <laughs> um, geography teachers, you know, who discover love late in life and then get dementia and, you know, but they're very brave and they don't, they refuse to give up their identity and, and it's all very moving. Um, and every time I get one of those, I just really, I seriously just want to stop and kill myself. And um, so there's, I get this script and I think, well, maybe it won't be like that because she's wearing some very funky clothes um, but you can't judge a book by its cover and then I read it and 48 hours later rang my agent and said we have to do this we absolutely have to make this film because this is the best script I've read in years and she wrote it while she was writing on The Office so she was writing all week at The Office and then for some reason mm. this young Indian woman wrote something for me she lives in LA 
she wrote sort of just a couple of hours every Saturday for three years. Wow. I mean, yeah, it's not weird, story. but you can, s- <laughs> <laughs> and slightly creepy. <laughs> But amazing, and I can see how she wrote it while working in the writer's room at the office. Indeed. Because she was very much in that environment. She was. Um, she said, yeah, she was the diversity hire, but she said she relates to both characters now because she's been the showrunner of The Mindy Project. She said, I've been that diversity hire. I've been the only woman of colour in the room, the only person of colour in the room, the only woman in the room. And I've also been the grouchy boss who comes in and shouts at everyone and gets furious and leaves. But I thought one of the interesting things about it was also the epiphanies that the entirely white male staff had about Molly's presence there as well. Because you could see at the beginning they were just inherently suspicious. And I feel a lot of men that I know now, it's like a lot of men I know have said to me something along the lines of, I'm one of the good ones. I'm not Harvey Weinstein, which is fair. They're not. (laughs) But it's like they've been holding a box of donuts the whole of their life. And they've got, but I've always offered them round. I've always offered the donuts round. And now someone's trying to take the donuts from me. And I don't know how to explain to them. The donuts were never yours. They were given to you in error. Now the donuts need to be in a box on the table. If there's 12 donuts and 12 people, everyone gets one. You don't get to pick first. And I've seen men recoil from this idea and go, they are my donuts. And I've always offered you a half. And so that it feels confronting. And I understand it. It must be annoying to have, you know, thousands of years of white male supremacy and to have been born five years too late. <laughs> That's really irritating. Isn't yeah, it? it must be annoying. I get it. I yeah. get it. It's just like, what the fuck? Like, all, decades of my life have gone by and the only people represented looked like that. And I think it's interesting to see how much Mindy allowed them to change as well and to find joy in diversity and I don't mean token diversity joy in working with Molly joy in seeing things differently and there's one point where your character says something along the lines of I want you to work with her because I don't want everyone to think the same everyone else in this room thinks the same Mm -hmm. and that was a really incredible moment I think in the film because that's very rarely said it's mostly we need diversity because of representation Mm. but actually it's a sometimes it's about diversity of thought oh god yeah Yes, absolutely. I mean, we are a sort of foreign language, aren't we, in many ways? And I've always had this, I used to have rows all the time with Ben Elton about comedy, whom I love and think is very funny. And he would argue about punchlines. And and I would argue that comedy, for me, wasn't about punchlines. Okay, so my mum used to work in rehearsal rooms and she used to say whenever a man started to tell a joke, she had a sinking feeling in her heart because even if it wasn't funny, she was going to have to laugh. Mm. Um, You know, and as it started, oh, here's a good one, here's a good one. And you think, oh, God almighty, fucking hell, how long is it going to go? And then I'm going to have to... (laughs) Um, That particular form of humour, I think, is very masculine because it is starting something and it builds, builds, builds to a punchline, which is like the ejaculation. (laughs) And that female comedy is much more circular and there's sort of nice moments in lots of different places, but it never quite comes to an end. Um, And when it does, you feel really satisfied. Um, So I think there is actually seriously a connection between us, the way in which our sexuality and our orgasmic Um, function (laughs) works and the way in which we laugh because as you know laughing proper laughing when you really really can't stop and the tears are squeezing out from the corner of your eyes is better than sex I think it is well no they didn't know whether to laugh at that isn't that interesting and I think that's because we don't ever want to admit that anything is better than sex because that makes us uncool and somehow think I can admit that now because I'm 60 um I mean, obviously not with my husband in the room. So actually, really hard, laughing very, very hard is not better than sex with my husband. I just want to make that absolutely clear. Um, but better than sex with all other people. Just yes. To be very... All other people. All other absolutely. People. Yeah. Oh, and to that point, mm. my character has an affair with a younger man. And I am a feminist, but if a man like him, mm. you know, offered any kind of interest in things, um, my reaction would not be 
like a 60 year old man which is oh just get washed and come to my room my reaction would be oh no darling no 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 that's not appropriate I'm not no, I'm not in any condition. No, 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 you don't. No, you don't want. No, 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 no. Please. Oh, no, God, I can't even. Oh, and then I start to think about it and become truly embarrassed and appalled. Now, that's not natural, is it? <laughs> Surely I should be allowed to be pleased. I really should be no, allowed to be pleased. I don't because I've been completely brainwashed. I think that's the structures around us. I'm a feminist, but John Lithgow, you still would. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? He is lovely. But I thought... What was interesting about this is John Lithgow had the woman's part because the woman's part is normally the wife. She only appears to be a bit sad and a bit distant, play a sonata and then be publicly humiliated and say, oh, it's all right, darling, I still love you, really. And that's all she gets to do. And this is the second film I've seen you. I saw you in Rumble Stanley Tucci, where it's very similarly, he just had to loll around in the background looking very miserable about your big career. And then go, oh, I love you so much from a distance. Uh, I mean, you're making a habit of it. I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. And the quality of man you can get to pine about you as well. Lisco, Tucci. That's no, I mean, really no, uh, incredible. It's, it is extraordinary. And I mean, hats off to those two who were able and willing to see good writing and support mm. a woman. You're absolutely right. I mean... You know, now, I used to say, I used to have a gag, you say that I'll have to exhume someone to play opposite me because I'm this age. But actually, that has changed a bit, although it is still very hard to get men to do those supporting roles. It is. It's very hard. Yeah, because and it's not their story. We're not looking no, out of their eyes. No. And I love that about this film as well, that although there are all of these guys in the writer's room and they've got lots to do and they're very funny and they're very witty, we're not looking out of their eyes. We're not empathising with them. Mm -hmm. We don't really care what happens when they get fired. They just go off and we don't see them again, which is normally what happens to women. Traditionally our role. Yeah, yeah traditionally our role. Or uh, we see, you know, somebody in the writer's room a bit marginalised or whatever, or we see how they react to Molly or how they react to Catherine. And then that's it. We don't follow them home. We don't follow home the man you have a plot line with. <laughs> if you've seen the film, you'll know what I mean. Who we would normally follow home. And we don't see him again. He just gets written out because he's not really relevant anymore. We are looking at this through your eyes. We're looking at it through Molly's eyes. We're somewhat looking at it through your husband's eyes, which is appropriate in this situation because there are emotions there. But it's really your story. And that's what's magnificent about it for me and I feel like it shouldn't be in 2019 exceptional mm. to be looking through the eyes of a woman over 50 and the eyes of an Asian American woman over 35 mm. but, it, but is. it is it's remarkable and what's so interesting about doing the publicity for it because I've been you know doing days and days and days where you do a junket which means that you're talking to lots of journalists one after the other some from Europe some from all over the place and um, what's so fascinating is they immediately get it. Well, it's so interesting how many issues there are in this movie. And there's the issue of ageism, sexism. And I said, okay, what's interesting about it is actually, it's not that they're issues, they're just the authentic lives of these women. So it's just normal for us. It's not issues, it's just life. And that, I think, is what's so extraordinary about that piece of writing, is yes. that you don't really... It's well, we don't wake up and think I live in an issue. No, no. I don't have an issue-based But we love. do, in fact, yeah. live in an issue. A big, fat fucking issue. Just saying. It's still remarkable that 99 times out of 100 when you go to the cinema, you're looking at a very niche experience, which is a white, straight male life. That's quite niche. Because given, it's say, in this country, half the population, over half the population are female, and then of the male population, some are gay, some are trans, some are men of colour, some are disabled. The actual white, straight, male, cis, non-disabled life experience is quite niche. And it's great that that minority is represented so frequently. <laughs> it's good to put minorities on the screen. But I'm just questioning whether we need as much of that minority experience because it is presented as a majority experience. And we're really good at looking through the eyes of white men we are very all very skilled at it I remember I was watching It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas with Susan McComa 
And she was sitting there crying and crying. And I thought, it's so interesting because she just knows how to look through James Stewart's eyes mm. and feel for him and for herself in that moment. She's really skilled at that. But a white man will very rarely look through a black woman's eyes at Christmas. <laughs> and <laughs> it's true, though. And if he does, it'll be a black woman film. So it's sort of like, oh, I'm watching an exotic piece of world cinema or it's you're still not quite invited to sort of just inhabit and get in it's like oh look at that other experience just because it's just so rare what I would say to all of the podcast listeners is please support this on opening weekend because that's what makes the difference between this kind of film being made more frequently and for this to become normal and for this to be something where people say, oh, we tried making a film with women who were, you know, not 22 and drinking the whole time. Because um, there's certain sorts of films women are allowed in. Yeah. Drinking and falling over. Yeah. Occasionally as a large group. Yeah. It's allowed. Yeah. yeah. And shitting. Yeah. Yes. That often <laughs> is part of In it. public. Yeah. Going to India and then having some kind of culturally appropriated life epiphany. <laughs> You're allowed to do big, that. Very big. In a sarong. Yeah. yeah. Sex in India uh, as, as, a, as a spiritual experience. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to not have the confidence to open a cupcake shop. <laughs> yeah. Until you met a man yeah. who was a loser in every other way, but had the key to the cupcake inside of you. Yeah. And that's why you end up with him. Yeah. That would be open to you, as long as you were also able to make him realise that he should be making handmade coffee tables. Yes. <laughs> Those are the things that we can... We can but just <laughs> ambitious women on screen charging around and not having time for anything outside work and not being interested in anything outside yeah. work. You don't see it. No. Do you know women like that normally in films are cured? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're yeah. cured by romance... That's the bad ending. That's the sort of like, a man will come along and make you see. And what I loved about Lithgow is when your character says, well, I don't have any friends or any children. You didn't want that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You wanted this. You wanted a full and excellent career. And that's what you got. I don't think I've ever seen that on the screen. No. I don't think I have either. And especially in this form, which is a kind of straight up comedy it's a comedy. It's not designed to be an art house movie. I mean, it actually was going to be a studio picture, which is unusual because mm. it's such a great script. And because Mindy has this form, it was going to be made by Fox 2000. And we had to postpone because we had disease in my family. And then we had to postpone again because Mindy got pregnant and inconvenient life things happened mm. of that nature. And in the end, we shot it last year in New York in 25 days for about $17. And um, it was, you know, it was one of those passionate, we, mm. because I, we so wanted to make it and everyone wanted to make it. Everyone, nobody was being paid, but everyone was there on set 16 hours a day for 25 days because they wanted to create this thing that mm. we've never seen. And I know it's, why have we never seen it? It's so sad, isn't it? But it's great that it's there. And when people say, well, now we'll have late night talk show, maybe we will, because when you imagine something like that, Mindy's imagined her. Yes. And so oh, she... like in Star Trek, informed a lot of the technology we have now. Indeed. <laughs> it did. It did. Because, because people inventing things were watching Star Trek and going, oh, well, how would you make that? Similarly, it's possible that some television executives in America will watch this and go, do you know what, we could make this a reality. We could actually make this a reality. If they offered you... A <laughs> and they'd look like that. And they'd, <laughs> their eyeballs would be swirling around in their heads. And yes. If they offered you a chat show, mm. would you take it? Certainly not. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's gruelling and relentless work. It's gruelling and relentless. So, plus it's late at night, which is yeah. just doesn't... I mean, I'm in bed by about 10. Oh, no, you so, can't do it. No, I couldn't do it. We well, could choose it in the afternoon. They could screen it in the evening, though. That could be good. True. But I... <laughs> now, this is off the record if you want it to be, just to stay in this cone of silence. It doesn't have to be on the podcast. You mm. just did an episode of SNL. I did. Yes. Mm. Do you want to talk about that or no? Yeah, I, oh, I'd be fascinated to Fantastic. talk about that. Great. Excellent. Let's get in. <laughs> okay. Saturday Night Live. Yes. How was it? So, it was really interesting because I think that that's a very particular culture. Okay, first thing, the writer's room is very diverse. 
lots of women, lots of people of colour, very diverse. The schedule is from the 70s. The schedule is from the days when they all were up all night because they were taking drugs and John Belushi would refuse to do any sketches written by women. And Gilda Radner kind of got by because she was just accepted somehow because she was so extraordinary. Because she was Gilda Radner, exactly so. So that schedule has persisted and I think it's way too brutal. I really do. And I indeed said that to Lorne Michaels. I said, that just, he said, well, I think writers, you know, they just work better at night. I said, have you, have you ever tried, you know, tried writing during the day? Um, <laughs> because I've always found that's a help. Um, there's just this sense of, oh, it's this wild thing that happens every week. And I got there and all these young people, mm. and I'm not young, but they were so tired. They were so tired. That was the thing I sort of took away was this exhaustion at the end of 20 weeks. And I thought, I wonder if that's necessary. I wonder if it's possible to have a schedule that doesn't mean that everyone's so exhausted they can barely move their lips until Saturday night when the adrenaline gets you going and you... You know, I mean, look, I enjoyed the wigs. I did. I enjoyed being dragged around the stage by Donna, who just literally dragged me. And then you get dressed like a dolly and you get thrown on again and you do another sketch. Yeah, it was it was it was a fa- it was fascinating because that world must have been impossible when you were a woman 20, 30 years ago. It's been going for 40, 40 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, very, very difficult. Then I imagine quite difficult now, but Amy Poehler tells a story in her book uh. about pitching a sketch. They were doing a lot of spoof adverts, and she pitched a sketch that was about sanitary napkins. And all the guys in the room, we don't get it, we don't get it. And she was like, Yeah, but half the population will, will get, it. get it. And often you have to ask who's on your judging committee. And they did it, and it was a big hit. I'm paraphrasing this. Please look in the book because this might all be wrong. But this is what I remember. And if it isn't what happened, it is what should have happened. So, same. Um, but I think often who is on your judging committee, who decides what funny is. Oh, absolutely. Because, well, I think the Guilty Feminist has demonstrated it, that Definitely. the experience of women gathers an enormous audience of women. Mm. Sometimes male comedians ask me, they'll go, well, what's your secret? But, like, they're pissed off. And I say, women are thirsty. <laughs> what, we've not been serviced. We go to the tap and there's nothing there. Yeah. Well, there's and lots of jokes about cocks and balls. There's loads of jokes in male comedy about their genitalia. I've noticed, over the years, I've noticed that. <laughs> and I mean, no, look, fair enough. They're very funny. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, you, you laugh. You're laughing, but you've learnt to laugh. You've learnt to laugh in the same way as you've learnt that when somebody tells a joke, you're going to have to laugh at the end of it, whether it's funny or not, mm. because otherwise you'll hurt their feelings. I think there's definitely that. And that's partly our stuff, because we can't bear to do that. It's so hard for us. And that one of the things I loved about Catherine playing her was being able to tell Reed Scott's character to shut up. And it works. And he did shut up. And I don't feel bad about it. Because I couldn't do that in real life. I couldn't possibly do it. I'm pathologically polite. And I couldn't behave like that. It was like having a sort of strange holiday. Mm. Being what able, a relief. Yes. Catharsis. It's you. like Hannah Gadsby saying when she's taken for a man, you know, she says, oh, no, no, that's fine. That's just five minutes, like, relief. <laughs> five minutes, you know, of just feeling like I own the world. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So there was a lovely 28 days that you did. The, was it 28 days you said you did? 25. 25 days. Mm-hmm. I'm gi- I was giving you a luxurious extra three. Yes, yeah. Oh, uh, those extra three would have really helped. <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a luxurious 25 days to just come into the room, point at people and say you're fired <laughs> and a release from the politeness and the shoving it down oh. uh, that most of us live with all the time. Well, look, it's a really, really successful film and... And I found it very cathartic to watch. Very joyful, very funny. I think the dialogue's very, very, very witty. Yeah, sure. Sometimes you go and see American films that everyone's laughing about and you've seen the trailer and the trailer's got a three or four funny moments in it and you watch it and you're disappointed by how little wit there is in it and the wit in this comes thick and fast. I yeah, think yeah. she's a really, really good writer. But I will just say again, if you don't go and watch it on opening weekend... And you don't tweet about it. If you don't hashtag late night movie, is it late night movie? 
Late night. It's just hashtag Nate Lyon. Oh, yeah, Nate I think Lyon. so. Um, oh, I don't you, know, actually. At Late Night Why would I know? UK. <laughs> I don't know any of this stuff. Um, so if, uh, you go on Facebook, it's forward slash Late Night Film UK. If you're on Twitter, at Late Night Film UK. And on Instagram, at Late Night Film UK. But also hashtag Late Night Film and uh, tell a real human. That's another thing you can do. I know. Shocking. Shocking. If you know an individual who would like this, WhatsApp them and just say, go on the opening weekend. Because honestly... If a film about two men in the workplace doesn't do well, do you know what they determine? That film didn't work. They don't say films about men in the workplace don't work. Cancel all the other films about men in the workplace. If a film about women in the workplace doesn't do well, do you know what they say? You've got to have women being romantic. Otherwise, it won't sell. Honestly, they draw that conclusion so quickly and you then have to wait for a decade so please, 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 please support it if you want to see more stories like this on screen. Are you on board? Yeah. Excellent. Guilty Feminist listeners around the world, wherever you are, if you're in the UK, it's June 9th that you're booking the tickets for. 7th. 7th? 7th. It's June 7th. Don't go June 9th because you've, you've missed opening weekend <laughs> and you've taken a bad steer from me and I will feel personally because I won't sleep. So you've got to book out June 7th or June 8th, get a group of friends together and book out a whole group of seats and go and talk about afterwards, okay? We're all committed to that. Um, you've all seen it, but you could see it again because I think some of you didn't pay. So <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't pay, even if you buy a ticket and give it to somebody else, that would be really, really appreciated. It feels like too late in the day to say that that was the deal now. Just rude. Um, but you know what I mean. Uh, did you enjoy it? Yeah. Um, Emma, is there anything else you want to say that you want to leave on the table that you came to say that you feel you haven't said? No, I've just been listening to you and just been so admiring of what you're doing, which is actually direct positive action. You've got to remember that Mindy Kaling, who wrote this, was a diversity hire. She absolutely was. That's why it's so important that we back diversity hire, that we back inclusion riders, the thing that Frances McDormand recommended, and that you do what Debs has recommended. I'm old and a bit apologetic, so I'm just sitting here going, that's fantastic, that's absolutely exactly what we should be doing. So I'm learning in your wake, in your wonderful wake, and uh, let's do this again before too long. Let's do it again. If you're in the industry, start to make movies with different voices and television shows with different voices. If you're not, support, support, support. Find them out. Recommend them to each other. Look them out. This is not the only story like this. They're out there. We need to make them popular because they only really care can this film make us $1.99 or not. So we need to show them movies like this make money. Please go and spread the word. Thank you so, so much to everyone here at the Picture House Central. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, a huge, huge thank you to the wonderful Emma Thompson. <laughs> and Late Night and all who sail in her. You've been an absolutely wonderful audience. Let's go and get smashed. We've been The Guilty Feminist. I've been Deborah Francis-White. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White. Guest co host Dame Emma Thompson and our very special guest, Mindy Kaling. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selinsky for The Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Victoria, Kat, and everyone at Entertainment One and Picture House Central, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. And don't forget to go and see Late Night. Hello, Guilty Feminists. Hello, I'm Margaret K. Bond-Smith. I'm Jessica foster -Q. You know us off this podcast Yay! you're in the middle of listening to. Yay! We are here because we want to tell you about a play that we're both in called Brexit. Don't be put off by the name. No, it's nothing um, like the real Brexit. No, it's actually really good. It knows what it is. It lasts an hour and 15 minutes. Rather than a lifetime. <laughs> a lifetime Potentially. of hell. Um, it's very sort of clever and funny, and it's quite feminist, isn't it? In the sense that we're both very... 
with um, high very status. high status yeah. women in it. Neither of us are in bikinis. There's no, I've point. got. I've been allowed a suit for it, and yes. um, a long time ago, trouser suit. Trouser suit. Yeah, same you as me. as well. Yeah. So, there are no skirts. Yeah, in this. is it? It's more guilty than feminists to say I feel quite sexy in a trouser suit. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I no. Did. It's just that we're not used to having any power. No, at we're not all, used so to having any exciting. power as comedians and actors. <laughs> a long time ago, I did a law degree, and I've had friends from university see the press pictures for this play and say. The road not taken. And, um, of course, you could have been. In a way, there. I'm basically, this is as close, being in this play is as close as I'll ever get to making my mum happy with my <laughs> career. So please come and watch it. Please come and support us. It's brilliant, funny, clever, clever play. And there's a special offer for Guilty Feminist listeners. All tickets are only £15 with the offer code BREXIT15. Yep, go to kingsheadtheatre.com for tickets and we will buy you drinks afterwards. That's a bit much, that won't happen. Not guaranteed. No, not guaranteed. <laughs> 